Y'all go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 7 this morning. I was uh, kind of fighting through some of this because, you know, sometimes God doesn't release us from where we're at. And have you ever noticed you can read something a thousand times over and over and over, and then one day you read it and something new clicks, and it's just like, wow, where did that come from? Well, I'm, 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 my prayer is that there's something in this that clicks with you this morning, because I know that I have been off and on this passage now for close to a year, so I'm running real close to being up there with Mark and the Pitt Potiver's house in prison. I'm not there yet. I've got three more years to get there, but, you know, I'm going to work on it. I did... Um, <laughs> I did get beat this weekend. No. <laughs> she hasn't felt good this weekend. She wasn't able. <laughs> no, uh, I, I met up with me and Jay. I went over to my mother's house yesterday, and, and CPAC was this weekend. So President Trump was speaking, and apparently he spoke for two hours and two minutes. So I walk in the door, and my mother looked at me. She said, wow, President Trump just beat you. And I had no idea what she was talking about. So then I turn around, my phone goes off, and I look up, and it's Dan. Dan says, hey, President Trump just beat you. And I'm thinking, my goodness. And then I looked at his time, two hours and two minutes. I was like, well, he didn't beat me by much. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to try to beat him this morning, so don't worry. I want to go back through Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8. I can't get away from this, and my prayer is that something clicks, something, uh, uh, something makes sense, because I think that, that many times we are bound by things that we don't realize. Does that make sense? Sometimes we have a mindset or a mentality or a cycle that we go through, and we don't really understand why it's there. We just know that we can't get uh, uh, any further than so far in, in what we're doing. And, and so we need the revelation of, of the Lord to show us. So if you look at Romans chapter 7, and we'll start in verse 15. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want but I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law and that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin who dwells in me. For I know nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want, I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells in me. So I find it to be law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law in my very inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, one thing I want you to understand is there's no chapters and verses. We added that much later. When, when Paul wrote this to the church, uh, to the Roman church, or uh, 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 the Christians in Rome, when he wrote this, he did not have chapters and verses to separate it. He just wrote this clear letter going out. So as he's writing this, he continues right on this point, and he says, but don't worry, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me read you uh, um, a post that I put on Facebook this week. Legalism is a bondage in which a person never feels free or accomplished unless they have reached a standard of performance making them feel self-justified. The new freedom or hyper grace is actually freedom to be in bondage. This ideology does not remove the bondage, but instead teaches us to ignore and deny the bondage and accept its limitations as part of our lives. And even to celebrate these struggles and call them freedoms or identity or self-expression. True freedom is found in putting the works of the flesh to death, which are at war with God. By the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of the born-again, blood-bought believer, only when the Spirit of God is used to put the works of the flesh to death are we truly free. Then we walk in the inheritance of sons and daughters, truly being joined with Christ in His inheritance here on earth. So one thing that's really bothered me over the last several years is there is this struggle. There is this war between legalism and freedom, right? We call it, I'm not, I'm not under the law, but I'm free to grace, right? So there, we need the grace of Jesus Christ, amen? 
And there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you feel condemnation, it's not from God. It's either from man or it's from Satan. Either way, it's actually from Satan. So if you feel condemned or worthless or unworthy, all of those feelings, all of those emotions are not from God. Conviction is when he tugs on our heart and we know that we've done wrong. We know that we have grieved him and we are actually hurt for hurting him. That's not condemnation. That, that is a, 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 an awareness that I have broken my connection with the Lord. So there's this idea, and, and the church went so far during a season that the church began to be so heavy-handed with the law, with the law, with the law, that we created this measure of what we have to live up to. So then when we look at living holy and we look at, uh, at living righteous, then we think there's this imaginary standard that we have to live up to that we can't measure up to. You can't measure up to it. I can't measure up to it. Man cannot measure up to the holiness of God. We, we are unable. So, so we have this imaginary standard. So then people go so far the other way. And it's just like when you're driving down the road. If you run off the road, you have to make a correction. But if you overcorrect, you flip. And oftentimes we make overcorrection when something is abused. And now this is a misrepresentation or a mischaracterization of God's character, right? So God is not this, this mean uh, God waiting to punish us because we don't measure up to some imaginal stand, uh, 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 imaginary standard. Nor is he this God that just is a free for all, do whatever you want. He's not a hippie God. <laughs> So then we have this movement that came out of, of a rebellion to that and it moved into a hyper grace movement that says anything goes. It's OK. Live like you want to live. We're all covered in grace anyway. It's greasy grace. I was reading an article this morning that, that uh, I think it was this morning. Could have been last night, which would have been this morning. <laughs> but it was an article about a, a megachurch pastor uh, that was uh, on a talk show recently and they asked him, and this is a charismatic church, and they asked him about um, abortion. And, and now, now we can argue over a lot of things. We can debate on, on many, many things in Scripture and is this for today and is this not and all this kind of stuff, but there are some things that, that are just uh, not debatable, Right? The murdering of, of a baby is not debatable. Now, I do believe that there are ladies who have abortions that they need healing and they need restoration and the church should never condemn or shun them. We need to love them, uh, 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 no doubt. But the idea to accept it is a whole nother story. So they asked this megachurch pastor, they said, is abortion a sin? And he said, well, you know, we need to take everything by, by a personal case-by-case -case basis. And, and you know what I would sit down with this person is I'd ask them first, well, what do you believe? Guess what? It really don't matter what you believe. <laughs> because if it mattered what you believe, I would wake up every morning and go, I believe I'm a multimillionaire. <laughs> but guess what? <laughs> that has not worked yet. We could go climb up on the roof and come to the edge and say, I don't believe in gravity and go to walk off. If you do that, I will come visit you in the hospital. I may even wheel you out if you get out. It doesn't really matter what you believe. There are absolutes whether you want to believe in them or not. So what happens is we, we revolted as a body away from, from absolutes into this hyper grace that, that says the law is, is not where we're, uh, what we're bound to. And what it boils down to is very simple. What happened was there was a mentality within the church that was trying to force Christians or believers into a conformity of slavery to religion. Period. If you think to, for God to love you that you've got to dress a certain way and look a certain way and have your hair cut a certain way and all this kind of stuff, then you've got the whole deal wrong. I tried to have long hair one time. And it came out more like a mullet. Not quite a mullet, but it was more that direction. Mark had long hair and he looked like Bon Jovi. It was just, you know... It was the Bon Jovi bush. Sean, however, was blessed with curly locks. 
So Sean had hair about right here, and, and it was blonde, and it was all one length, and he looked like Michael Bolton when Michael Bolton was popular. So he would go places, and people would be whispering behind him, and they'd say, is that Michael Bolton? <laughs> so one day, and now my parents, you know, they were not thrilled about his long hair. You know, as preachers, uh, as pastors, the last thing you want is your child to have, you know, your son to have hair like a hippie, and it, but it was beautiful hair. Matter of fact, Sean and Shannon were walking to the mall one day, and one of Sean's friends came up and, and, and you know, <laughs> said, wow, your hair's prettier than your wife's. <laughs> so anyway, when Sean went to law school, that was really not what conducive for a young lawyer, so he got it cut. And after all the hassle my parents gave him, after he got his hair cut, they both almost cried. My point is this, it's not a matter of the way you look. God loves you. If you shave your head, if you can't grow any hair, or if you have it dragging the ground, that really doesn't affect the way God loves you. And whether you dress in a suit or you dress in shorts, and I'm not going to show up to, I say that, be careful what you say. I have no intention of showing up to a Sunday morning service in shorts. One, I think I, I, I respect my position more, but secondly... <laughs> I don't want to take your focus off of the message and, and onto my chicken legs. <laughs> there are some things that just are not right. <laughs> Savannah hassles me. I'll, I'll come through the house. She'll say, mm hmm, forgot leg day, didn't you? See, it's not about this religious conformity, and that's where the church got was this religious conformity, this heavy-handed thing. So what Paul says, if you read through the, through the uh, uh, chapter 7, he says, thanks be to God that the law, because I, am, I did not even know what sin was until the law showed me what sin was. And then I realized because of the law that I couldn't measure up. So then is, is the law bad? Absolutely not, because it showed me what was sin. In other words, the law being there revealed to me just how how off I was but the law did not give me the power to correct it with the father it only showed me where the enemy was working so there's no condemnation in me because I'm under Christ Jesus and sin is crouching at the door waiting to pounce on me and I'm struggling oh if there were just a deliverer to save me from my own struggles and thanks be to God that there's no condemnation because this flesh inside of me that wars against my spirit my spirit says let's do this and my flesh says let's do this but the this war that's going on. I'm not condemned at the war, but I understand that the flesh inside of me is fighting against God. This is chapter 8. I'm not going to read all of chapter 8 for you. I know that's very disappointing. There are some days I read like a scholar and other days I read like a kindergartner. Some of that depends on how well I can see. So let's, <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> The story. He says, the flesh is at enmity with God. Our fleshly desires were made up of a flesh, a body, a soul, which is our emotional being, and our spirit. So there's this war, our soul's in the middle, our flesh desires to do what is fleshly appeasing, our spirit desires to do what is God-pleasing, and in the middle is our mind, will, and emotions where we debate. That's why oftentimes you can find yourself in a struggle, an internal struggle in your mind where you are fighting against yourself, saying, I want to do this and I don't want to do this, or, or I, I want to do this, but I lack the ability. That's what Paul was saying. He says, you don't understand. There is a war going on inside of us because our flesh is warring against what the Spirit wants us to do. But don't worry. Don't be condemned. Don't beat yourself up. Instead, understand that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of you and will empower you. Thanks be to God that He gave us the law to understand what sin is. Thanks be to God He gave us the law to understand that you and I can't measure up in our own strength. We were never meant to. So when the devil tells you that you'll never be good enough, he's right. In your own strength, you'll never measure up to anything. That's why God didn't tell us you have to measure up to this standard to get through. It's like the roller coaster ride. You know, you got to be so tall. Well, you got to be so holy to come in the church. <laughs> if that were true, 
every church would be empty with no preachers. <laughs> Because there is no standard that you and I can measure up to in our natural ability. Because what happens is, let's say we get everything on the outside right in our own sheer will and determination that I'm going to live a holy life and I'm going to abstain from everything. I'm going to kick the TV out of my house and I'm not going to wear anything that doesn't cover from here to, to the floor and I'm just going to live perfect. Number one. What good does it do to have the outside fixed and the inside riddled? Number two, that's only going to last for so long because you're working something in the flesh and you cannot sustain it forever. You don't have to turn there, but Isaiah 53, this is the, the atonement. And he says that Christ, this is a messianic prophecy, he said he was wounded for our transgressions. And he was bruised for our iniquities. Now, a transgression is a sin, right? And a wound is something external. It's something that happens on the outside of the body. But he says that he was bruised for our iniquities. The bruising is something that is internal, even though it can show on the outside. It is an internal condition. And iniquity is not a sin. Iniquity is, by definition, it means to be crooked. It means a crook. It means to misalign. So the iniquity is the sin nature. So what Paul is struggling with in chapter 7 and chapter 8 is the sin nature versus... The sin itself. You can even overcome the sin, but if you don't overcome the sin nature, you live in an internal torment, tormented by your desire to do what is wrong. So what he says is that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of us, not only to free us from the, the sin itself, but to free us from the desire to sin itself. He says we have the ability not to be free to sin, but to be completely free from sin. Does that make sense? But that's not all. Because it goes beyond just being free from sin. See, wouldn't it be great if you think about this in a, in a legal setting, that every time there's an accusation, because Satan is the adversary, right? That's a legal term in the Greek, and it means accuser. So every time Satan accuses you, he has nothing to stand on. That's powerful. Every time Satan accuses you, he has nothing to stand on. He's looking for legal access into our life. So when fear comes at you and he tries to hit you with something and we stand up and say, no, you don't understand. That is not in alignment with what God has already shown me. I, I, I bind those words. I rebuke those words in, in the name of Jesus. He has no grounds. Why? Because it's not in my strength. It's not in my power, but it's in the spirit of God that lives inside of me. So then Paul goes on in chapter eight and he says, but for those those that, that allow the Holy Spirit to put to death the work of the flesh, they are no longer slaves to sin, but now they are sons and daughters. Now this is the key to the whole thing. We had a generation that tried to conform slaves of, of religion, and God doesn't want slaves. He wants sons and daughters. God does not desire uh, uh, robots. He wants a relationship. So Paul says, now we become sons and daughters by the adoption of Christ. Now we cry what? Abba, Father. Now we cry out to God. And he's not some uh, 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 external thing up here that's, that's floating in the heavens that might intervene. No, he's our Father in heaven. And we stop and we say, oh, Lord, my God, my Father who is in heaven. See, oftentimes we, we have a, a struggle with people relating to the character of God because they had a bad example on earth. If you had a bad father and then you want to call God father, it's a little messed up. If you grew up in, a, in an abusive home, then you, you talk uh, uh, about God being the father and your first image, your first mentality or nature is to view him the way your earthly father was. Fortunately, I had a wonderful example of a father. And that makes it easier, I think, 
because I had this example of a godly man. I grew up in a godly home with a godly mother and a godly father who, who operated together. So I saw what a godly marriage looks like. That's something a lot of young people don't get to see anymore. And I saw what a godly home was like. And, and I saw what love and discipline was. I, I understood that there, I don't know that there was ever anything I could do that would ever stop my parents from loving me. Now, I don't mean that they would accept what I did. Don't, don't make a mistake. Because I, I knew that look. I'd come in the house and I was so guilty. If I had been around something wrong, it just showed on me. I'm a guilt reactor. My two brothers were not quite so guilt. Re Mark is the, is, is the best. He just has no guilt. He just, he didn't care. He just walked right in. Me? No, if I looked at something that somebody was doing wrong, I just had it on me and my mother has radar. So it wasn't about not having boundaries. It wasn't, it wasn't about not having absolutes. It was about understanding that there was nothing that could cause them to stop loving me. And every rule, every guideline, every demand, if you want to call it that, was not meant to hurt me or restrict me. It was meant to prosper me. See, God doesn't lay out these laws to hurt us. He says, these are the laws in which I bless. And the enemy comes in to try to get us to misalign to the law so that we'll be under a curse. And God says, I need you to be blessed. I want to pour out my spirit on you. I want to uh, give you an inheritance as a son and a daughter, but I can't unless you align to my inheritance. That's what it's all about. It's not about regulations of control. It's about aligning to an inheritance of God because he wants to give us an, he says right here, he says, now you are joint heirs with Christ. Verse 16, you are joint heirs with Christ to inherit with Christ. That is so powerful to me. Jesus told the disciples, he said, greater works will you do. Do you know the disciples went on to do greater works? They went on to do more numerous works because Jesus, when he was in body, was confined to the body of a man. Right? And he told the disciples, he says, it's better for you that I go. Because he told them that he was about to be uh, given up to be slaughtered. And this is where Peter said, no, you won't. <laughs> I'm not going to let it happen. And Peter tried. For those of you that don't like Peter, you need to check your hearts. I'm going I'm to visit with Peter when I get to heaven, and I'm going to ask him, how did you feel when you chopped the guard's ear off? I'm just curious. I just want to know how that, that emotional release went for you. <laughs> so, so... Uh, Jesus said, they're about to take me, but it's better for you that I go. Because he understood that his kingdom was limited when it was confined to a man. He was 100% God, but he was 100% man. So he said, my kingdom is confined to me right now. So it's better for you that I go, because when I go, the Holy Spirit will come and empower you. And then you can do greater works than me. That's called inheritance. In Ephesians chapter 1, you can turn there if you'd like. We're going to go back to Romans, so you don't have to turn there. But in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now, when Paul's writing this to Ephesus, he does not say God will bless us. He says God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Think about that for one moment. Is your life where you want it to be right now? Y'all are quiet. That, that, was, that was where everybody was supposed to in use them say, <laughs> absolutely not. Is your finances right where you want them? Is your health right where you want it? Are your children, your relationship with your children, your, re, uh, your children's relationship with the Lord, your family dynamics, is it right where you want them? And if you have every one of those in perfection, then let me ask you this. Is Strop City where you want it? 
And if you still are in denial, are the roads in Strop City right where you want them? Especially Nav Street. I had a cop behind me the other day and I was waiting on him to stop me. I was driving in both lanes. I was, I was bobbing and weaving. I looked like I was, I was on, in NASCAR. I wasn't doing but about 30. That's all you can do. I was waiting on him to stop me. I looked in my rearview mirror and I saw him. He was just following me. I saw a thing on Facebook the other day and they had a car driving in a, stra in a straight line and it said, this is how you know in Louisiana when somebody's driving drunk. <laughs> so he says that every spiritual blessing is for us right now. This is our inheritance. He says, even as he chose it, uh, us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for the adoption as sons through Christ Jesus, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace and which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose that he he set forth as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. This is so amazing to me. So Paul's telling us in Ephesus uh, or in Ephesians, he says, you don't get it in the here and the now. We are a joint heirs with Christ and we have obtained a place and a position in this line of inheritance to walk in every spiritual blessing right here on this earth because God has predestined us to be sons and daughters of his kingdom. That's so good. Go back to Romans 8. I love this, this, this entire dynamic because I was thinking about some things over the last few days I had a gentleman that was visiting our church a few years ago and and he had visited for quite some time and he came out during the week and he said I need to meet with you and I said sure so he came in my office and and uh and he said I, I I've got an issue with how you preach and I looked at him and said I do too <laughs> but I'm learning and he said, I haven't seen one time where, where, where you preached a salvation message. Not, not on salvation, but a salvation message. And I sat back in my chair and I looked at him and I, I said, what do you mean? He said, well, every time we come to church, there should be a salvation message. And I said, when you first came to the church and you came down for prayer, I asked you if you were saved in the prayer line. Did I not? He said, yes. And I said, and I pray with you uh, because he, he was saved, claimed uh, a lot more. And I said, other than that, over the last couple months you've been visiting, we, we haven't had an a, a influx of visitors, have we? And he said, not that I've noticed. It's pretty much the same faces. And I said, exactly. So if I get up every week and I'm preaching salvation, one of us is doing something wrong. <laughs> salvation is the beginning. But sometimes when, in, in, in the Christian walk, we get stuck right there. We get stuck at birth that we are saved and we uh, 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 celebrate in our salvation and we stop there. But the word salvation means complete wholeness. It means healing. It means restoration. It means deliverance. The word salvation means everything. See, that's where it starts, but it does not stop there. That's the introduction into the family. That's when the adoption papers are signed and we are adopted as sons and daughters, but then we grow in the Lord and receive and walk in an inheritance so he says in verse 18 for I consider in the suffering of this present time not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed to us for the creation awaits its eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God for the creation was subjected to futility not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope that its creation itself will set us free from its bondage to its corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. This is amazing. It says that the sons of God will set creation free. Think about that for one moment. If the sons and daughters of God will set creation free, 
Think about our, our territory. If you drive 15 minutes up the road, you're going to come into Monroe. Monroe has a mayor that, that over the last few years has given the keys of the city to uh, LGBT groups and to uh, a very racist group, the Nation of Islam, the Louis Farrakhan uh, uh, group. So he has given the keys, the authority of the city to these groups. That gives that spirit, that demonic structure, legal right into a territory. So what, what Paul is saying right here, he says, as sons and daughters of God, the very creation, the territories, the region cry out for restoration for the purpose that God has for it. That means that when God created the heavens and the earth, every piece of dirt he had a plan and a purpose for. And it was for good and not evil. But it requires the sons and the daughters to receive an inheritance from heaven to walk out the authority of the kingdom of heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. That means our territory belongs to us. That means our nation belongs to us. That means the powers of darkness darkness and wickedness and principalities that are trying to destroy America. It's not for them. It's not their place. The only way Satan can prevail is if the church does not stop him. Why? Because when Peter had the revelation of who Christ was, he says on this rock, I will establish my governing body, my ecclesia, and the gates or the governance of hell can't prevail against you. That is amazing that we fight a war we cannot lose. The only loss we can have is if we forfeit. That's why Paul says, grow not weary in well-doing. For in due season you'll reap if you faint not. That gives us a key. That means that our loss comes in fainting. That means as long as we having done all to stand, continue to stand. Satan can't win. It doesn't matter how smart you are, how eloquent you are. All that matters is getting this aligned to God. That's it. So he, he goes on to say, creation cries out for its restoration through the sons and daughters of God. Verse 22, for we know. That the whole creation has been groaning together for the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. I love that. Hope that is seen. In other words, if you see it, that's not hope. Faith is not in what you see. Faith is in seeing or believing in what you can't see. Now hope that is seen is not hope for, for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not even know how to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose, for those who whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed in the image of his son in order that we, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. I love that passage right there. He says, you don't understand. When we put to work or to death the works of the flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit, we now enter into a place of being sons and daughters of God and joint heirs with Christ. When we become joint heirs with Christ, even the very territory we are in, cries out for the restoration that can only come from us. And when the earth cries out for the restoration that can only come from the sons and daughters of God, then we, in our own self, we don't have to rely in our own ability. He said even the Holy Spirit prays through us because we don't even know how to pray. If you've ever been in a situation where you didn't know how to pray, you understand. Sometimes the only words you can utter is, Oh God, help. 
And sometimes you just stop and you begin to literally, have you ever been so distressed and so distraught that you could only groan? I'm not talking about praying in tongues. I'm not talking about praying in the spirit. I'm talking about you were so just, just uh, 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 broken that the only thing that could come out was groanings. I think that God hears our groanings. I think that God speaks through us. The Holy Spirit, he touches our hearts and he cries out to God through the very groanings. We pray in the Spirit, not that we understand what we're saying, but that he understands that we're saying. So we pray in the Spirit and the Holy Spirit's making intercession for us. And when he's making intercession for us and through us, it is wreaking havoc in the enemy's camp. And Satan begins to tremble because he says that believer and that church has got a hold of something and I can't understand what they're saying. Oh, that's so awesome. That's so awesome. In, in war, we always try to use codes, right? So in World War II, uh, there was a, 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 a portion of our military that began to use uh, uh, Native Americans and, and, and the Indian language in order to communicate because the enemy was cracking all of our other codes. Well, just think, we have a code the enemy can't crack. Because the Holy Spirit makes intercession through us. Even in our groanings, even in our weakest moments. Even, because guess what? There are some things you don't need to pray about in English because you're going to mess it up. And I had no intentions of preaching or praying in the Spirit, but I'm telling you. There are some things I know better. I don't want my will. You got to be careful about praying your will. If you're not careful, you're going to get it. <laughs> but he makes intercession through us. And then it says, What then shall we say of these things? If God is with us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised and who is now at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Is that not awesome that, that Jesus himself is actually in heaven praying for us? Yeah. Now, you can turn with me or you can hold your hand there because we're not through in Romans. But Isaiah 53, verse 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his stripes we have been healed. Right? That's the atonement. That's the messianic prophecy. I love going to the next place because uh, sometimes we, we stop shy of where we're going. So we go on to the next chapter and it starts off, Sing, O barren one who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. See, he prophesies the Messiah is coming. And then he says, for those of you that have not bore, those of you that have not produced, those of you that have been barren, sing, O barren one, sing. Sing, O one who has struggled. Sing, O one who has failed. Sing, O one who has fallen short, because the children of the desolate will be no more. And then he goes on in verse 15. Uh, well, actually, let's come back to verse 15. In verse 17, he says, No weapon fashioned against you can succeed, and you shall confute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage or the inheritance of the servants of God, and their vindication is from me, saith the Lord. Now, if you take that back with, uh, with Romans chapter 8, and he says that, that Christ, that, that who can be against us if Christ is for us? Who shall condemn us? Verse 34. Who is there to condemn? Christ is the one who died. More than that, he's the one that was raised. And now he sits at the right hand of God, interceding for us. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. And we are regarded as sheep to slaughter. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. 
through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor ruler, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation can ever separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he bore the price for our transgressions, our iniquities, our failures, our weaknesses, our sins, our physical healing, our emotional healing, our failures, our lack of prosperity. He bore it all on the cross and he raised from the dead and he put his spirit inside of us to empower us. So if we are with Christ, who can be against us? Every weapon raised against us shall fall. We don't have to fear warfare or demonic attack or struggles because it says every tongue raised against us in judgment, it will be refuted. That's our inheritance. Oh, that's so good. Now let me give you a warning. Verse 15 of Isaiah 54 says, If anyone stirs up strife, he is not from me. Whoever stirs up strife with you shall fall because of you. So in Romans chapter 7, he says, I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I want to do. There are times we have mentalities or cycles that are operating in our lives unwittingly, unknowingly. And these cycles, as long as they are allowed to operate, they give a, a legal access of the enemy or they limit or restrict how far we can go. So if there is strife in anyone, he is not from me. That's what Isaiah 54 says. Just before he says that we are, uh, 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 that every uh, uh, weapon against us shall not prosper. And over here it says in, in Romans that, that we are more than conquerors. I like the idea of being more than conquerors. I love the idea of being a conqueror, but I love the idea of being more than a conqueror because God is a God of more. He's a God of abundance. He's a God that, that is uh, uh, so far above, uh, above and beyond. He does more than we can ask think or imagine according to Ephesians so we are more than conquerors but the enemy wants to gain legal access so there are cycles or patterns that are uh, uh, started in our life and it holds us into this uh, uh, this circular pattern wandering around the wilderness year after year strife unforgiveness unforgiveness is a big one why because I don't know that you can forgive without the power of the Holy Spirit that's the honest truth. So we get up and we can say, well, oh, Lord, I forgive so and 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 so. But the next day, we still hadn't forgiven them. So we go through it again. Lord, I forgive so and 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 so. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that forgiveness truly comes because forgiveness comes from love. We have to be able to love those that we don't like. Y'all like everybody, I know. I didn't hear what that was, but I can only, I can only imagine. <laughs> now this is, I really have, I, I actually don't know where I'm at in my notes. I got through the first part. I got, y'all got me off on, y'all got me going around in circles, in a cycle, no. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we break free of cycles. Have you ever noticed somebody with a, with a spirit of rejection stays rejected? They come down, you can pray for them, and we break that spirit of rejection and it's broken off. Six months later, they're rejected. Right? Somebody with a spirit of strife, it really doesn't matter what you say, they're going to find something wrong with it. And it's going to be against them. <laughs> <coughs> I've had people call me and say, I'm upset with you. And I'm like, really? Why? Because I can't imagine why you'd be upset with me. I'm kidding. I say, why? And they say, because you did this, this, and this. I'm like, really? <laughs> Was I there? Because <laughs> there's a spirit of strife. Right? That's the work of the enemy because if he can bind us in strife, then, then we can't see the blessing that is right ahead of us because we're too worried about who might be mad at us. Somebody with a spirit of rejection, every time there's an opportunity to be reject, uh, rejected, the enemy just sits there and whispers, oh, see, that was personal towards you. 
Oh, he's preaching right at you. <laughs> I had a visitor one time come to the church, and, and I, was, uh, I didn't know he was going to be here. I, didn't even, I actually did not even know who he was as, as far as anything about him. I knew, his, I knew his front name. I didn't even know his high name. So, so when he came in, I, I didn't realize that that was him. So when he came in, he sat down, and I, I didn't think anything about it. I just go on and, and preach my message. And there were some points there that were a little hard. So they were sitting in, in a particular seat, so I avoided looking at that seat. I focused mainly on the back wall above everybody's head so nobody could take it personal because I ain't looking at nobody. Well, when he left, he kind of stormed out, and I was like, oh, I do not have a good visitor ratio. <laughs> so I talked to the family that he came with the next day, and they said, oh, man, he was so upset with you. I said, why? And they said, well, he was upset with us, too. I said, why? And they said, because he was convinced you were preaching right at him and that we had told him, told you everything about him. I said, you barely told me his first name. And they said, yeah, I know, but he don't know that. So I had to go meet with him. I'm like, dude, look, I need you to understand. I don't even know anything about you. I don't know where you're from, who you are, anything else. And he's like, really? So, so how did you know this, this, and this? I said, I didn't. I was just preaching. It was on my notes. I didn't know. You didn't know you were coming till that morning. He said, no, I didn't. After that, it clicked. He said, do you think God was talking to me? <laughs> I said, well, it sure wasn't me. <laughs> See, but when you have a spirit on you, a cycle, then the enemy just works and works and works. You can have a spirit or a poverty mentality, and if you don't break free of it, it doesn't matter how fat your bank account gets. You are still bound by a poverty mentality. That's why 87% of lottery winners end up filing bankruptcy within the first 10 years. Because if you don't break free of a poverty mentality, you're still bound. See, God wants us free. He wants us delivered. He wants us whole. But I want to get to the key nugget in, in all of this. If you look through history, American history, and in, in, in recent history, you'll see a shift in society. And it started in the 50s. There was this rebellion that began to stir in the 50s. It didn't actually manifest until the 60s. There were some things that happened in the 50s. But our nation, no matter what some preachers say and, and no matter what politicians say, our nation was founded as a Christian nation. And as long as there is a remnant of the church in America, it's still a Christian nation, period. God has blessed us. The only reason America has been so blessed is because God himself blessed this nation. And the only way uh, that we can uh, uh, continue to be blessed is if we keep alignment with the Lord. So what happens is right now America is at this crossroads. There are those in power that want to destroy America. They want to dismantle America at its very core. We have socialists that we have put into office and they want to take our nation into socialism. Well, if you have any sense at all, you will know that every socialist nation that has ever tried it failed we have those that say we shouldn't have kids in fear of global warming we shouldn't have cows I'm going to stay focused I've had to watch myself because you know there are some things that are being said right now on the political scene that are just too, too humorous to let go of Andy, we, we, we don't need farmers because we have supermarkets, just to let you. <laughs> we, we have some bona fide geniuses that have been elected in. And they're broke when they get elected. One of them was broke when, 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 when she got elected, couldn't keep her, uh, her rent paid, but now she's about to be a millionaire and she's only been in office for a couple months. I'm telling you, there is something to this whole deal. Now, see, we have those coming into power that absolutely hate our nation and they want to destroy it. They want to dismantle our nation. We have politicians that have stood up and called for the assassination of our president. That doesn't happen in a civilized society. That happens in a third world country, not in a society like this. Why? Because this is a Christian nation and the enemy is trying to destroy it. And the reason he's gained power is because the church didn't stop him. 
So we had this this uh, uh, uprising in the 60s and it manifested in our in our youth of the 60s, which are no longer youth. <laughs> they're in Washington <laughs> and they're still tripping. <laughs> I tell you, feel the burn. It's felt some burn lately. But what happened was we had Woodstock. We had Haight-Ashbury. We had the sexual revolution. We had Roe v. Wade passed. We had all of these things happen in a short time. And, and, and to, to uh, uh, kick a boot to it, we had the Vietnam War. Do you know why we fought the Vietnam War? No, you don't. <laughs> to make rich people, and that may be right, to make rich people richer. The Vietnam War was when the government abandoned its sons and daughters. We sent our, our soldiers over and they fought in a war just to come back and be spent on. See, we, we had this, this transitional shift where we stopped being sons and daughters of a nation and we began to be a rebellious generation. So the connection between the father and the son, the mother and the daughter, it was broken. And then the family unit came under attack. We used to have programming that showed the father as this uh, 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 loving father that would come in and he was the authority of the house and he and the wife had this wonderful relationship and everybody was happy. Now in modern television, the daddy is the dummy. The weak spine dummy that can't protect his family. Mama's got to protect the family because daddy don't have the backbone to do it. And the kids talk back to their parents and tell them what they're going to do. We were watching a show one day and a, and a, a, a teenager started talking back to uh, the, the daddy and got up in his face. And J.L. just puts his head down. And, and Savannah said, oh, I know what you would do. I'm not sure what my daddy would have done because I never got in his face. <laughs> I'm smarter than that. <laughs> See, it was, it's a, what happened was in society, we saw the breakdown of the family. And in the church, we saw the breakdown of the family. We saw the breakdown of spiritual sons and daughters. So people stopped uh, 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 coming in and trying to inherit from spiritual fathers and mothers. And they begin to take on a corporate mentality. So young ministers come into a church and they don't look for a father to inherit from. They look at an old man to kick out of the way so they can be promoted. That's a corporate mentality. There are things that happen within churches that you would be ashamed of that happen in churches because there is so much competition, strife, and secular humanistic techniques that govern inside churches and ministries all across the nation because people come in and they've been trained by the world how to come in and take over. So the idea is if I can get him out of the way or I can get her out of the way, then I can get their position. That's not how God works. God works through inheritance, through sons and through daughters. Outside of the apostles, one of the greatest people you're going to hear about in Scripture is Timothy. Timothy was not a servant, but yet he was a servant. He had a servant's heart. The way that Timothy came about being imparted to Paul, Paul himself calls Timothy a spiritual son. And the reason he was a spiritual son is because when Timothy was a, a, a young boy, Paul would come in to minister and Timothy's father had ran off. So he was being raised by a single mother in a generation that did not understand something like that. And Paul began to impart to this young man over and over and over. And then as he grew, he would come in and Timothy would run to Paul and he would cling to this father figure. And as time went on, when he was a, uh, uh, approaching adulthood, Paul took him in under his wing and said, you can come with me. He inherited as a son. So then Paul tells him over and over, he calls him a son in Christ. And he says, by the gifting on your mother and your grandmother, stir up that gift inside of you. Son, you're not given to a spirit of timidity or to fear, but of power and of love and of self-governance. Why? Because he was a spiritual son, not a slave. See, God is restoring the hearts of the fathers back to the sons. This is what Malachi 4, 6 says. It says that he will restore the hearts of the fathers to the sons, lest he smite the earth with a curse. So if he, if he does not restore the hearts of the fathers to the sons, he'll smite the earth with a curse. 
So if A equals B, B equals A. So if you reverse it and he does restore the hearts of the fathers to the sons, then he'll pour out a blessing on the earth. We are on the brink of the greatest revival that the church has ever seen. And we've been fighting and fighting and fighting. And what's happening is God is restoring back the heart of inheritance to spiritual sons and spiritual fathers. He's restoring back the spiritual inheritance to God the Father. And then nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Then no weapon formed against us can prosper. I'm going to Prepare to get ready to close. That's a preparation to a preparation of closing. Let me give you a couple points and, and, I, and I will. Joel chapter 2 uh, uh, verse 28 says, In the last days he's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And it says his sons and daughters will prophesy. It doesn't say that the members of an uh, of a organization will prophesy. It doesn't say that, that a certain denomination is going to prophesy. It doesn't say that a church in America or a church in here or a church in there is going to. He says sons and daughters. You can fill a pew. You cannot fill a pew. Or in our case, chairs. Which I recently found out you can't be a church if you have chairs. I didn't know that. Pews actually didn't start till 3rd century A.D., not that you're really worried about that. And it started in the Catholic Church because the priests started preaching too long and people started getting tired of standing. <laughs> Every generation expands on the previous generation, so I don't know how long they preached, but anyway. He says, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Let me give you two examples. I wasn't going to give you verses, but I have... It's taking me this long to get back to where my notes were. That's, that's, that's impressive. There are two times in Scripture, well, there's multiple times in Scripture, but there's two that I want to point out real quick. I'm not going to read the verses to you. Instead, I will, I'll give you some, some references there. Joshua to Moses. This is the epitome of a father-son inheritance. During Moses' time, Moses was, uh, he was running from the Lord. He was running from people. He was uh, attending sheep in a, in a desert in, in Ethiopia. And he comes around the corner and, and there's a bush that's on fire, but it's not actually being burnt. And he's a little confused. And then this voice comes out and God calls him a deliverer. We know the story. He goes back and he leads the people into deliverance. At this point, Moses was 80 years old. He lived the first 40 years under the reign of uh, in Pharaoh's house. And then the, the next 40, he lived in the, in the wilderness. So he's 80 years old. And when he comes out of Egypt, he, the, they're not in the wilderness very long. He sends out 12 spies. And when he sends out these 12 spies, they, they all return. And 10 of the 12 can only tell you about the giants in the land. They can only tell you about all the bad things. But these two guys, Joshua and Caleb, they come back and they're like, Moses, we brought back some grapes. And they're like this. He says, man, this place is awesome. They never saw the giants. They saw the land that was made to, to uh, uh, adequately supply for giants. And they thought we are about to live like kings. This is a land flowing with milk and honey. All they saw was the promise of God. So then we know the story. The, there was a, a fight there between the ten and the two. And, and, and they ended up staying because the ten could not align. So as time went on, it was Joshua that clung close to Moses. Moses would go to the tent of meeting and the glory of God would fill the temple or the tent fill around it and it was Joshua that would come up to the door of the tent and he wouldn't move until the glory left it was Joshua that when Moses was headed up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, here comes Joshua right behind him carrying his stuff. And then Moses had to tell him, son, you can't go any more than this. You have to stay right here. So that whole time, 40 days, that Moses was in the glory, Joshua was just outside the boundary that God would let him go to, and he would not leave. Nowhere have I found to this point 
that Joshua was a self-promoter, that he tried to assume some level of leadership that was not his. Nowhere have I found yet. The only time that I really see Joshua doing too much wrong was when the Spirit of God fell on people and they began to prophesy. The Spirit of God lifted and two of them kept prophesying. And, and Joshua came to Moses. He says, hey, man, something's going on. We got to stop them. And he says, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that everybody would prophesy. That's the only time you really see a major correction because Joshua was a son. He was there to inherit from a spiritual father. So in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 38, God actually tells Moses, he says, this kid's going to be the one to lead the people into the promised land. Over and over in Deuteronomy, he says, anoint Joshua. He's the one that I've anointed to take my people to possess the land. Because sons and daughters inherit from a previous generation. A generation that inherits always goes further than the previous generation. So there is a generation now that is inheriting not only from the hall of faith of Hebrews 11, but we are inheriting from those that have gone on before us. The Billy Grahams and the Earl Roberts and the Ruth Grahams. We are inheriting from the David Wilkerson's and the, uh, uh, and the revivalists, the William J. Seymour's, all these of the, of the healing movement and of the Pentecostal revival. We are the generation that will inherit from all of them. But this time will be different. Because this time it's an inheritance of sons and daughters for a purpose. To unite man back to the Father. The next was Elijah and Elisha. Y'all know that story. For those of you that, that have not read through that, it's 2 Kings. First and 2 Kings is, is a Elijah and Elisha, but the transfer is in 2 Kings, the second chapter. Let me just read a couple points to you, and, and then I'm going to wrap it up. But Elijah performed so many miracles, but he also fought so much opposition. Elijah, he would perform these miracles, but then he would run from Jezebel. During the day of Elijah, there was a school of prophets, right? And the school of prophets would actually live in caves, hiding out from Jezebel, because Je Jezebel was trying to kill anyone from the school of prophets that would not convert over to being a prophet of Baal. Sounds like America today. So they were hiding out for their life, and Elijah was one that wouldn't hide out for his life, not, not in the caves with all the other people. Elijah was his own one. He was like the superstar, right? So one day, uh, uh, God is actually going to anoint his predecessor, and God does not tell Elijah to go to the school of prophets to select a predecessor. Instead, he's walking down the road, and there's a, a, there's a kid that's plowing the field. He says, he's the one. Go throw your mantle on him. And he goes over, and he throws the mantle on him and says, hey, follow me. And Elisha leaves his home, leaves his family, leaves everything to follow the prophet. So when Elijah would come up, the school of prophets would all, he was like the rock star coming. And they would all back off and go, oh, there's Elijah. So then Elisha just followed him. And he was obedient to him. And he became a son uh, uh, of Elijah. And then when it came time to transfer that anointing, then 2 uh, Kings chapter 2, uh, Elijah tells Elisha, he says, you stay here. I got somewhere to go. And he says, no, sir, I'm not going anywhere that, that you don't go. I, I will be right by your side. I'm your shadow. Get a bigger pocket because I'm climbing in. So the school of prophets came to him and said, Elisha, we know something's going on. There's this rumor, there's this stirring in, in the prophetic that says Elijah is about to be taken out of here. Don't you know that? And he, Elisha tells the school of prophets, and I'm going to paraphrase in, in, in modern my English, shut up and leave me alone. He says, quiet, leave me. But to me, that says, shut up, leave me alone. Get out my face. You're disturbing and distracting me. So Elijah says, stay here. He says, no. And then they go to the next place. He says, stay here. He says, no. And they go to the next place. He says, stay here. And he says, no. And he says, what do you want? He says, I want a double portion of what you have, daddy. He receives a double portion. Well, the miracles under Elisha 
were miracles of provision. So Elijah, there's a widow, right? And she's about to starve. So Elijah is used to perform a miracle and it's just enough to give her food through the famine. Elisha, under a double portion anointing, has a very similar circumstance with a widow, but this miracle allowed her to be debt free. I, w- I love the idea of God providing enough for every meal during a hard time, but I really love the idea of being debt free. There was a difference in the anointings upon them. Elijah operated in a season of just enough and Elisha operated in a season of double portion. Elijah did miracles that just sustained somebody during a hard time. But the first miracle Elisha did was he came into a city that was broken because the water source was poisoned and he healed the water source that brought restoration to an entire region. See, we've been operating under miracles for the last two decades that were just enough. Provision that was just enough. But there is a generation now ready to receive a double portion anointing through a her- inheritance as sons and daughters. And it's going to be an anointing that will turn regions over. It's not too late for America. America is in this crossroads and we have those that are trying to take it in the wrong direction. And we have those that are trying to allow the enemy in on every side and in every way. But there is a church of Jesus Christ in in our nation today. And there's a remnant rising up and they're saying no more, no more, no more. It's not over. If our worship team will come, let me give you a last thought. See, we're, we're, we're about to receive an inheritance, amen? But here's some of the hardened realities. This past season's been hard. Really? I expected a lot of amens on that one. <laughs> trying to get it up, is that what? <laughs> trying to forget it. <laughs> We, we have spiritual PTSD. <laughs> it's been a hard season. It's been a hard, hard season. Spiritually, economically, emotionally. It's been a hard season. There have been better seasons in life. There's been better seasons in America, right? I heard a statement the other day from R.T. Kendall. It was either him or Derek Prince, I don't remember. But I heard a statement that was very interesting. They said, gifts are imparted, fruits are developed. That's a, that's a deep thought. The gifts of the Spirit are imparted to us by the Spirit, right? But the fruits of the Spirit are developed. James chapter 1 says, Count it all joy when you face various trials and tribulations because the trials and tribulations, they produce in you. They work your patience. And that per- patience, when it's had its perfect work, leaves us at a place where we are lacking nothing. So I, I begin to, to look at the fruits of the Spirit. And they are love, joy, peace, Forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So when we come into a season of inheritance where there are gifts of the Spirit being poured out. And I love the gifts of the Spirit. But the problem with the gifts of the Spirit is if there's no fruit to govern the gifts, then the, then the gifts become useless or actually they can become detrimental because there's no fruit to govern them. Think about prophecy. Prophecy is a gift of the Spirit. I love prophecy. I love when God begins to reveal things. We, we went to, to Virginia uh, last summer, and Mark has a friend that was going through some, some things in his life, and uh, he asked if we would pray with us. Well, the only thing I knew about this guy was that, that he could bench 315 pounds. That's the only thing I really knew, that and, and, his, and his first name. So uh, he's, he's a little bit shorter than me and my size, and he can bench 315. So my concern when he got there was, was very simple how you do it so we're on vacation we were not working right so mark said well we're gonna go have breakfast with him and i said we who because i'm on vacation and breakfast was gonna be at seven o'clock i said how about y'all go and i'll meet up with y'all 
for brunch. <laughs> He said, well, we'll uh, he said, I'll take mama and we'll go to breakfast and then we'll come, by, come back to the house and, and then we can meet with him and pray with him. And in the back of my head, I'm like, I don't know how to pray for this guy. I don't know him. So when he got there, uh, he comes in and I, had, I got ready. I mean, I got up and ready just in time for them to walk in the door. Mark called me. By the time I finished brushing my teeth, he said, hey, we're, we're about to walk up. I was like, divine timing. They walk in, and, and so I shake his hand, nice to meet you, all that kind of good stuff. And then I asked him, you know, how much do you work out? He said three days a week, about 30 minutes a, a day. And I went, Phew. So I expressed my, my flesh side, that that's just not right. And, and then Mark said, well, let's pray. So I had no idea what they had discussed at breakfast. Well, at breakfast, they were eating, and my mother, the Spirit of the Lord came upon her. She began to prophesy and speak into this guy's life. I didn't know that. I didn't know if they had prophecy or bagels, and I really wasn't worried about it. I was still trying to get my brain working. My cup of coffee had not kicked in yet. So we come over, and we go to pray for him. Well, the Spirit of now this guy is a Ph.D. in Baptist theology. So Mark warned him. Look, my mom and my brother, they don't pray like normal people. <laughs> now, if, I probably could have been funny and started out, you know, Lord God. But we just weren't praying. So I, I, was, uh, I did know that he was Baptist and I knew that he was a PhD. So my mother's praying or Mark, one of them's praying and, and I just start praying in tongues and I'm doing it very, very quietly so he don't really know what I'm doing, you know. And then I begin to pray and, and I begin to prophesy over him the very words that my mother had just spoken to him over at, at breakfast. And he began to weep, not cry. I'm talking about full grown, a man that can bench press uh, uh, twice my body weight is sitting there weeping under the power of God. Mark's laughing because he knows that I'm saying the same thing that my mother said. I love prophecy because prophecy says to somebody what man cannot know. And they know that they're being touched by God. How else and ever, if somebody has a gift of prophecy, but they do not have the fruit of the Spirit to govern that gift, the next thing you know is they are having you mail in 599 for your first prophetic work. Or 25, or a gift of any donation. <laughs> it is the fruits of the Spirit that govern the gifts of the Spirit. They give us the ability to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. So let me give you this real quick. Love. Love is not developed within two people you are, that love you. Jesus himself, he said, anybody can love somebody who loves them. He said, but I tell you, love those that hate you. So love is developed in a season of hate. Joy is the next one. Well, joy is a state of mind, not an emotion. Anybody can be happy. Right? If you can't be happy, if Ed McMahon would have showed up on your doorstep... And that van would have been parked outside your house, publisher's clearing house. And he would have had that, that check walking up to your door with more zeros than my eyes can really digest. You would be happy. And if you would not be, then you seriously need some psychological help. <laughs> Happiness and joy are not the same thing. Happiness is an emotion, but joy is a state of being. So a fruit of the Spirit is not happiness that can be determined by any circumstance, but it is a joy. It is the joy of the Lord. It is a state of being. Joy comes when there is weeping. Joy comes when there is frustration. Joy comes when there is a lack of happiness and God gives you joy in the midst of your problem. Peace is the next one. Do you know where peace is truly exhibited or built or developed? In the storm. Anybody can have peace when it's peaceful. I have a friend right now that's going through a battle, uh, a medical battle in her family. And, and um, I was talking to her the other day and I felt like the Lord had given me some things to, to share with her. So I, I texted her. I, uh, the, I said, hey, I was praying for you and your family and yada, yada, yada. And I gave her these, these things and she said, oh my goodness, so you don't know how, how needy this is and how confirming this is and so forth. And she said, I don't understand. 
I said, what do you not understand? She said, even though all this is going on, I have a peace that I don't understand. And I said, that's the peace of God. There is peace in the midst of the storm. See, it requires the hard times. We've been through a hard time for two decades, but it requires the hard times to develop the fruit of the Spirit that will enable us or develop the character in us to handle the gifts of the Spirit. So there is love when you are hated. Have you been hated? There is joy when there's unhappiness. Have you been unhappy? There's peace that's developed in the storm. Forbearance is the next one. Forbearance is long-suffering or being able to suffer long or it is patience. It is developed during various trials. My dad used to say, don't pray for patience because every time he did, he would get into every slow line. You know, there'd be a lady at the bank depositing $100, one penny at a time and every person would pull out in front of him. See, there is a divine inheritance because my daddy had to pray for patience. I don't even have to pray for it and it happens. And it usually happens at Walmart. At the self-checkout. We, were, we stood there last night for 20 minutes in the self-checkout. This lady had three things. Three, three things. It was awful. Anyway, I'm, I, God was developing my forbearance, peace, joy, and love. Because I was struggling in all of them. Next one, kindness. Kindness is developed toward people who are not kind to you. Goodness is exhibited and developed to people who are not good to you. Faithfulness is, is exhibited and developed when someone is not faithful to you. Gentleness. Gentleness is developed and exhibited and shown to people who are not gentle to you. Self-control is the last one. I love this one. Self-control is developed when you are about to lose control. It is in the hard times that God develops in us the fruits of the Spirit. When God develops in us the fruits of the Spirit, we are being enabled to handle the gifts of the Spirit. Y'all stand with me this morning. We are in a time and a season where God has taken us to a new level. I'm going up. You're Joshua. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He didn't say, y'all, you got to serve the Lord. He said, there's a blessing, there's a curse, and you choose. Well, I'm, I'm kind of at the place right now that, that I'm like, God, I can't carry everybody up. But God, I want to go up. I want to go to the next level. I want to go to the next place. And we've been, many of us have been through hard times over the last uh, 5, 10, 15 years, 20 years. We've been through a hard season. We've been hurt. We've been abandoned. We've been left. And thanks be to God, there is healing and restoration. Thanks be to God that we have failed, but there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God that I may have fallen short, but there is the grace of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit Lord I thank you this morning I thank you this morning for your freedom from every bondage right now in the name of Jesus I declare right now every chain and shackle is being broken I declare every cycle of the past is being broken in the name of Jesus thank you I declare a ceasing to the mental warfare. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, Cast down every thought and imagination that exalts itself against the revelation of God. What that means is everything God has revealed to you, His promises in His Word, His promises that He's given you in prayer, everything that challenges what God has said, we have to cast down. What I feel is there are many people that are fighting a war in your mind from the thoughts of the enemy versus the promises of God. And right now we cast down every thought and and imagination we bind the whispering of the enemy right now in the name of Jesus every tongue every voice raised against us in judgment is refuted in Jesus name Lord I thank you 
I thank you this morning. This is a this is a group of people that is here to inherit. This is a group of people, Lord, that needs an impartation. Lord, this is a group of people that need deliverance from the enemy's attack. And Lord, we declare today that you are our deliverer. You are taking us from our warfare and giving us victory for who can be against us when we are in Christ Jesus. For we are more than overcome. I declare this morning, Lord, we are overcoming. Lord, I thank you for this past season. I thank you, Lord, for the warfare. I thank you for the struggles. I thank you for the lack. I even thank you for my own failures. Because God, in my failures, you have corrected me and brought me into a new place. In our warfare, you have healed me and restored me. God, I thank you that the struggles we have faced have only been used. They were not from you, but they have been used by you. I thank you, Lord, that you have been working to build the fruits of your spirit in my life that I may inherit a new mantle as a son. I thank you, Lord, that this people, this church, the people of this church, Lord, they have been fighting so much opposition and warfare and struggle. Lord, I thank you that you have been working in them for the fruits of the spirit, the character to handle the gifts that are about to be imparted to them. And Lord, today I stand here seeking the inheritance of a son. And I seek to impart an inheritance as a father. Lord, I thank you that you are turning the hearts of the father to the children and the children to the father. I thank you, God, you are releasing a new wave of your power and your anointing and your blessing upon our nation. I thank you, Lord, you are raising up a new generation that will take seats in Congress, that will take seats in leadership, that will take seats in local municipalities, Lord, to turn back territories back to you, oh God. They will not release the keys to racist groups. They will not release the keys of a city to abominations. Lord, they will release the keys to your word and to your kingdom. Oh, it's a new day. It's a new day. And Lord, right now in this house, I break the frustration off. The whirlwind, those cycles, I break it right now in the name of Jesus. The internal struggle, I bind it in Jesus' name and I declare peace where there is struggle, peace where there is conflict. Thank you, Jesus. 